Living longer. Living healthier. Living better than ever before. Welcome to Mountain Pacific's Healthy Living for Life, a weekly series that gives you the information, education, and expert insight you need to become an active participant in today's ever-changing healthcare climate. Here now is today's program host. Age can sometimes get in the way of clear vision, and while a lot of issues can be taken care of with glasses or contact lenses, our risk for serious eye diseases and conditions increases as we age. Welcome to Healthy Living for Life. I'm your host, Colleen Roylance, and today we'll talk about how we can protect our vision at any age. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. Joining us today is Dr. Ken Morse. He is an optometrist with Wyoming Eye Care. Ken, thank you so much for being with us. We're going to talk a little bit about thank eye you, health. Thank you, Colleen. Pleasure to be with you, and uh, thanks for having me. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So, you know, Ken, I have worn glasses since I was in second grade. But in general, at what age do people start to experience problems seeing clearly as they're getting older? Well, yeah, if we're talking about age-related vision changes, then we're probably talking mostly about what's called presbyopia. And uh, presbyopia is a Latin term that actually means old sight. And uh, typically presbyopia starts in our early to mid 40s, and it usually ends at about our 55 to 60 age range. And what we mean by ending is that we've pretty much lost all of the ability to change focus up close that we ever had. And so normally when you are looking out at something in the distance, then the lens inside of your eye is elongated and it's for distance focus, whether that's naturally or whether that's with corrective lenses. When you change your focus to see up close, the lens actually thickens, it changes shape and it changes the focus up close. What happens in presbyopia is that that lens loses its pliability. It does not change focus from the elongation and so therefore we lose the ability to see up close. And that's when we all start thinking about reading glasses or the bifocals in our corrective lenses. And uh, I tell patients every day that misery loves company and that it happens to everyone. And it's just one of those facts of of aging. So uh, nobody is really able to escape it completely. So then you have to buy about five pair of reading glasses from the dollar store so you can have one in every room. If you're lucky and that's all you need is the help for up close, that's how a lot of people accomplish <laughs> accomplish. Them. They have them just laying everywhere. So what if you okay, so what if you aren't lucky and you do have, you know, other common age related vision issues? Um, you know, one that comes to mind is having difficulty seeing in the dark. Can you talk to us a little bit about why that happens? Yeah, so This is where we'll liken um, our eyes as an optical system and we'll liken it to what happens with a camera. Um, So our pupil is is um, has the ability to change shape, change size, which is like changing the aperture of a camera to change for different lighting conditions. So typically from a physiological standpoint, during the day when the light is bright or we're in a bright room, a brightly illuminated room. Um, our pupil is more constricted and that increases our depth of focus. But at nighttime, when the light is low, the pupil is supposed to dilate to bring in as much available light as possible. One thing that happens as we add birthdays and age is that the size of our pupil typically and physiologically stays a little smaller. It just doesn't dilate as much at night. And so therefore that can cause some restrictions in how well we're able to see at night. Now, there are other conditions that can affect how well we see at night. It can be as simple as, you know, a a refractive error or a prescription in your glasses not being quite right. 
um, or it can be in regards to some of the age-related changes, which we'll talk to uh, as we go along, namely development of cataracts, um, macular degeneration, um, and in some cases, glaucoma, among other eye, eye conditions. And so there are things that can happen, uh, again, that are going to affect our night vision above and beyond just that physiological aperture size um, that changes in the age. That's interesting. So what about, uh, I know that night driving, driving at night becomes difficult. Is that kind of the same thing? Because there's a glare issue. Can you talk to us a little yep. bit about that? Yep, and again, related to pupil size can certainly be a factor there. Now, typically with glare, um, and particularly if it's an increase in glare uh, difficulty or glare disability, a lot of times what we're gonna see happen there is, is because of um, media opacities. And what we mean by media opacities, that can be a little cloudiness um, or a little haziness in the corneal surface, which is the surface, uh, the clear lens of tissue on the front part of the eye. But it also is in regards to the cataracts too. Um, anytime that you have some media opacity, you get a light scatter effect. And it's very similar to if you did not quite scrape all the frost off your windshield on your car on a cold morning, and you happen to drive into the rising sun, it just glares out, it lights out. Well, that's a light scatter effect. It's very similar to what could happen as images are focusing through the pupil um, into the back part of the ride and get some glare disability. And what about, what? here's another common one, dry eyes is it actually that our eye that we're producing fewer tears or what's what's causing that it could be uh, uh, the production of fewer tears so with dry eye um, maybe the best way to understand that is think of our tear film as basically being made up of three different layers or three different components so the watery or the liquid part of our tears is produced by a gland that sits right up underneath the, uh, the upper eyelid. It's called the lacrimal gland. And its job is to secrete um, and produce the watery part of the tears, which then by gravity and blink action funnels down over the surface of our eye. The second layer of the tear film is a lipid layer or an oil layer. Now that comes from the eyelids, and you have about 20 to 25 glands. They're called meibomian glands. They're in the eyelids, and they sit just on the backside of where your lash follicles are. Well, their job is to secrete oil into your tear film to make your tear film a little bit more thick or more viscous. So the oil mixes in with the watery part of the, tear, the tears produced by the lacrimal gland to make it more viscous so it doesn't evaporate as quickly on the surface of your eye. And the third component of the tear film is called the mucin layer, which is produced by some cells just on the surface of your eye. So you think about dry eye, it can be um, an inactivity or a deficiency in any one of those three layers. But um, most common, what we see is probably some inactivity or deficiency in the oil glands, not necessarily a production of tears, but it's more of a quality of the tears that are produced. They evaporate very quickly. However, you can, with age, you can see a reduction in the amount of the liquid part of the tears. More commonly, it's seen in women, more so than men, and it tends to be a little bit more common in postmenopausal women too. There are certain medications um, that, that a lot of times we're on as we age that have an effect on that tear production as well. So yes, so it can be, uh, in answer to your question, it can be due to reduction of tear production, but there's other factors as well. Dr. Morse, that sounds uh, just a tad bit complicated. We, uh, we're gonna take a little break. And then when we come back, we'll continue to talk to Dr. Morse uh, about some of those eye diseases he mentioned earlier. So stay with us. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. We're talking with Dr. Ken Morris. He is an optometrist. And Dr. Morris, you know, one thing that I really wasn't aware of is that vision loss is actually considered a public health crisis and that millions of Americans have the potential to develop vision loss or perhaps even 
you know, blindness. Can you tell us a little bit about why you think we have such an increase in cases of vision loss or impairment? Yeah, so if you look at the, the two most common um, systemic or underlying things uh, as it relates to vision loss, one, we'll talk a little bit more in detail, is macular degeneration. And we're seeing more and more macular degeneration uh, because, again, the age of our population continues to get older. We're living longer. Um, so as we're living longer, we're seeing more and more cases of macular degeneration with the increase in life expectancy. And two is, is vision loss or blindness related to diabetes. And as we've seen from several sources, you know, diabetes is becoming a bit of, a, of an epidemic condition, particularly in our country. Um, the, the number of increases in cases of diabetes seems to be just going up every year. And so, again, I think that's probably a factor in, in increases in the numbers of visually impaired individuals. Yeah, that does make sense. And so for those who have uh, diabetes, diabetic retinopathy is, is one of the um, conditions that they can have. And what, how, does that, how does that happen? And can it be treated or prevented? Yeah. So let's, let's kind of touch on a little bit what's happening with diabetes. Of course, with diabetes, it's typically elevated blood glucose levels. And when you have elevated blood glucose or blood sugar levels, it's gonna potentially affect the blood vessels. And typically, especially in the case of diabetic retinopathy, it's what we call a microvascular uh, condition. And what that means is that it's affecting the little tiny blood vessels in the retina that are called capillaries. So diabetic retinopathy is where we see enough change in the capillaries with little tiny blood vessels in the retina where we start to see changes in those blood vessels which can result in either leaky blood vessels where we see hemorrhages or we'll see changes in the walls of these little tiny blood vessels where there's a weak spot we develop what's called a microaneurysm and those two conditions the hemorrhaging or the microaneurysms are eventually going to result in circulation changes and basically that's what happens in diabetic retinopathy is it's a circulation change uh, where it becomes compromised. And um, in the early forms of diabetic retinopathy, we just see the early changes like hemorrhages, microaneurysms, and maybe some isolated areas of, of compromised circulation. But in the more advanced forms of diabetic retinopathy called proliferative diabetic retinopathy, when circulation becomes compromised in those little tiny blood vessels of the retina, the body's natural response is to try to improve that circulation. So it starts to grow new blood vessels in areas where the circulation is compromised. Well, the problem with the new blood vessel growth is that you've got blood vessels that are now appearing in areas of tissue that are not supposed to be there. And secondly, it's like replacing bad plumbing with even worse plumbing because they tend to leak because they are so new, and that's called neovascularization. Wow, that's a lot. And just to clarify, you do have to have diabetes to have diabetic retinopathy. Yes, you do. And then again, uh, because of the blood glucose levels elevated, you can have a different degree and a different type of retinopathy, which produces many of the same clinical findings. And, and we'll see that in, in rare, fortunately rare cases of hypertension or high blood pressure mm -hmm. that has not been very well controlled. Okay. So that's another instance of retinopathy. Okay, okay. So let's go back to uh, glau glaucoma. You mentioned that one a little bit earlier. And can you tell us about that one? And is, there, uh, is that one that has a, a family history becomes important? It is, yeah. And so the most common form of glaucoma is called an, a primary open angle glaucoma. And yes, family history is a pretty strong risk factor for it. So when you have direct family history, parents, grandparents, or siblings, your chances of developing glaucoma, particularly as we, as we age, are higher. And so glaucoma in its primary form 
is simply where the pressure of the fluid, which sits inside of the eye, just behind our corneal tissue, is where that pressure is too high. And as that pressure maintains at a higher than normal level over a long period of time, eventually it causes damage to the nerve fibers, which are in the back part of the eye uh, that are part of the retina, which then causes an irreversible vision loss. And that's why with glaucoma, it's typically somewhat of a painless condition and it's a very slow moving condition. So we tend to screen for it routinely. And those are the pressure tests, the air puffs and so forth when you have a routine exam. Okay, and we're gonna have to stop and take just a quick break. We didn't quite make it to age-related macular degeneration. So maybe when we come back, we can start there. And then let's move on to talking about how we can protect our vision. So thank you for staying with us. We'll be right back, don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Healthy Living for Life. We've still got Dr. Morris with us. He's an optometrist in Wyoming. And Dr. Morris, we talked, we mentioned age-related macular degeneration in the last segment and didn't have time to talk about it. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit right now. Yeah, yeah, so again, age-related macular degeneration um, is, is becoming more and more common and more prevalent. Again, I, I, we're living longer. Um, we're seeing the age-related changes, um, and, and really, you know, our diagnostic capability of finding the early cases of age-related macular degeneration, I think, have improved with technology. But um, one thing that helps when we're discussing age-related macular degeneration is to is to kind of define the macula. Well, so the macula is the very center of the retina. It is in the back part of the eye. It's the center of the retina where our straight-ahead central vision is. That's where our best vision is. And so when we have macular degeneration, it is a breakdown of the layers of the retina that involve that central vision. And when that becomes compromised, it affects our ability to see fine details. Um, our peripheral vision generally remains fairly intact, but it's that central vision and the ability to see details that start to become compromised street signs, road signs, it affects people's ability to drive, to see people's faces, and then also with reading, it affects the ability to see small print. Thank you. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, how we can protect our vision and our eyesight as we age. You mentioned diet, and we've all heard that you gotta eat a lot of carrots, but really, uh, what is it about diet, and are there certain foods that we should pay attention to? I think that diet's becoming much, much more of an emphasis. And what we're seeing, you know, from a neutral, nutraceutical standpoint is the ability of antioxidants to be able to protect our vision. And these antioxidants, what they do is they improve cellular function. And, and they're a way to like rid the cells of, of like garbage material. And so the common antioxidant uh, are, are what we see with vitamin A, um, or beta carotene, as you mentioned, carrots, of course, have a lot of vitamin A or beta carotene. But there's also vitamin C, vitamin E. There's also zinc, which has been implicated as an antioxidant. And the newer ones are called lutein and zeaxanthin. These are called carotenoids. And so when we're talking about carotenoids, those are the things that we see in, in the dark green leafy vegetables like spinach, like kale, um, other, you know, really brightly colored fruits and vegetables. And um, so if we have a diet that's full of those as far as the raw foods, very good. Um, many of us, you know, aren't very good about including a lot of that in our diet. And so there are supplements that we can take, which are aimed at increasing those uh, carotenoids and those antioxidants, um, again, aimed at vision preservation as we age. Okay, and, and, and another thing that we talk about a lot on our program is physical activity. And so can you talk to us a little bit about how just moving more can help us with our vision? Yeah. Yeah, and, and let's go back to, again, the two common things, you know, diabetic retinopathy and macular degeneration. And one of the things we see as risk factors for those is lack of physical activity. You know, we see increases in body mass index. 
We see increases in hypertension. We see increases in cholesterol levels and lipid levels and um, arteriosclerotic changes. And those have been implicated, you know, from again, from a microvascular standpoint, to be a risk factor for the development of, of again, the diabetic retinopathy macular degeneration. Um, and I do want to touch on one of the modifiable risk factors besides getting enough exercise, especially in regards to macular degeneration, is smoking. Um, smoking has been shown to be a significant risk factor, primarily for age-related macular degeneration. So there's a lot that we can do. And, you know, one other thing that I think about a lot because I'm on my computer all day and then I'm on my cell phone and then I'm watching television and we all spend a lot of time on screens. What advice do you have for us? Yeah. So the hot term that we see nowadays is blue light. And this is the blue light emanating from all of our multiple screens, whether it's the TV, the computer, the cell phones, the iPads, and so forth. Um, now, blue light is somewhat uh, inconclusive if this blue light emanating from these, these various screens is harmful to our eyes long term. Most of the recent studies have indicated probably not. Um, some of them have been inconclusive, but one thing is we are on the computer every day, all day, is to try to give our eyes a little bit of a break from this near point, this continuous near point focus. And so um, they've come up with the 20-20-20 rule. Uh, a lot of people have heard about that. And simply what that is, is that for every 20 minutes that we spend looking at our screen, the idea is to take a break for 20 seconds look away from the screen, let our eyes refocus at something farther away, relax that accommodative or focusing range we talked about, and, and do that for at least 20 seconds. Um, so for every 20 minutes, take 20 seconds break and look at something 20 feet away, 20 feet away or farther, and that's the 20-20-20 rule. That is fascinating. I had not heard of the 20-20-20 rule, so I'm going to give that one a try and see how we go. Dr. Morris, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate all the great information. Thank you, and again, thanks for having me. And thank you for watching. We hope you'll join us again next week on Healthy Living for Life. And until then, stay fit, stay well, and stay healthy for life with Healthy Living for Life. Thanks. Healthy Living for Life is brought to you by Mountain Pacific Quality Health in partnership with AARP Montana. We'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions for future programs, visit our website at mpqhf.org or call us at 406-443-4020. You can also catch us on YouTube by visiting our website and clicking on the Healthy Living for Life logo. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions.